Good morning, and uh, we're here this morning worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table. Some of you are new to our fellowship, some of you are brand new Christians, and we welcome you. I know of a few of you, and it's just a great joy to know that you have come into life through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Some of us may not know the joy, at least we haven't jo- uh, experienced that for a long time, because we haven't witnessed or we haven't been a part of that, but I can assure you it's a great, great joy. When we partake of the Lord's table, I don't know about you, but many times we come to it, okay, we're supposed to do this, and uh, you, know, you might have been at another fellowship or even here, come and you partake in it, but it's doesn't have that much meaning. Christ came into this world to provide this table for us. But he came, and it was in the midst of tremendous problems. Tremendous problems. If you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be going through Mark 14 rather quickly. Every first Sunday of the month, we go with the Lord's table, and we don't do uh, an extensive sermon but we do want to see the significance, the weightiness, the meaning of the Lord's table. And uh, we find that here in Mark 14, the Lord instituted the Lord's table. There's several other places where the Lord speaks, the scriptures speak about the Lord establishing the Lord's table. But what I want to look at this morning is this, that Jesus Christ established this table that we're going to be partaking in the midst of, of realities that if we're honest we too see those realities in Mark 14 and uh, verse 22 we find the institution of the Lord's table and while they were eating he took some bread that is Jesus took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to them and said take this is my body and he took a cup And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink anew in the kingdom of God. That's the establishment. Jesus did it, right? But what I want you to look is the environment, the context in which he did it. He did this in the midst of murderous plans against himself. There were also worship of Jesus Christ at that time as well. But then there were conflicts and confrontations and betrayal and abandonment. In that context, he established the table we're about to partake. So I'm going to read just through the passage, and I want you to see that context. And it's going to inform us about our own life. About our own life. See, when we partake of the Lord's table, it's not just a religious thing that we do. Jesus comes into our life, and our lives are full of problems. Uh, Wounds, betrayal, fears, rage, immorality, and so forth. So Jesus understands. Jesus understands. he's, He's real, you see, about our lives. And so we begin in Mark chapter 14 and verse 1. Mark 14 and verse 1. Now the Passover and the unleavened bread was two days off. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, lest there be a riot of the people. This is the context. This is a couple of days before he instituted this table. And Jesus knew, of course, that they were plotting to kill him. Okay? So he understands about murder and about, about people hating us. He understands that totally. 
And while, verse 3, and while he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, and reclining at table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. Very costly. It was about a year's worth of work, of labor. You think about that. Working a whole year to buy this bottle of perfume. Very, very expensive. And she broke it and poured it on Jesus. How would you like to worship the Lord Jesus Christ that way? A whole year's worth of work in one act of worship. Jesus knew he was being worshipped. He was wanting to, he, some wanted to kill him, and others were worshiping him. That was some of the context. And then we go on, verse 4. But some were indignantly re remarking to one another, Why has the, this perfume been wasted? For the pu perfume might have been sold for uh, 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. <laughs> Imagine that. Somebody worshiping the Lord Jesus and then others scolding her. This is the context in which Jesus instituted the Lord's table. And then he had to confront him. Leave her alone. She's done something good to me. Jesus didn't reject that worship. He's God. He's God. And then he told them, well, let me read verse 6. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do them good. But you do not always have me. She has done what, is, uh, what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. What? What was the woman doing? The woman had gotten the point. Jesus had already said several times, I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to be raised from the dead. She had gotten the point. Wow. And she was worshiping the Lord Jesus. She's anointed me for my burial. Verse 9, and truly I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached to the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. And Judas Iscariot, who was the one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to uh, try him, uh, betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money and began seeking how to betray him in an opportune time. This is the context in which Jesus gave, is given us this table. Betrayal. And misunderstood. So this table is not just some religious thing we do. Jesus comes into our realities of life. All of them. All of them. He also shows himself absolutely sovereign. Absolutely sovereign. For now we read in verse 12. And on the first day of the unleavened bread. When the Passover lamb was to be uh, sacrificed. His disciples said to him. Where do you want us to go? And prepare for you to eat the Passover. <laughs> Jesus says in verse 13. And he uh, sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He himself will show you a large upper room furnished 
and ready and prepare for us there. He knew exactly what to do. Who was going to be there? Someone car carrying a pitcher. Hey, just, just go. <laughs> See, I already know. And I'm the one that organizes all things. I am absolutely sovereign. Even though they want to kill me, others worshiping me, others rejecting me, misunderstood, fighting over ridiculous things. You don't understand. Some get me that I'm going to be die, and you don't get it. And some want to, be, some want to betray me, but I am absolutely sovereign over all of it. They went and poof, guess what? <laughs> they found exactly what he said. When God says something, you can take it to the bank. You can, it's, it's better than solid gold. When God says something, that's the way it is. Whether we like it or not, whether we enjoy it or not, <laughs> God is sovereign. And then, verse 17, he announced, Hey, one of you is going to betray me. Verse 17, and when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. Of course, they became troubled. Verse 19, and they began to be grieved and to say to him, One by one, surely not I. Isn't that something? We all know we're guilty of something. <laughs> If we're honest, we know we're guilty of something. I don't know if you have this experience, but you're driving down the highway and a patrol passes you. You look through the mirror. <laughs> Sometimes you know that it's not right. Surely not I, Lord. Jesus comes into our realities. Verse 20. And he said to them, Is the one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to, be, is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man not to have been, been born. And then he institutes the Lord's table. He institutes the Lord's table. And after he's done... They sing a song, verse 26. Skip over to verse 26. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. <laughs> Verse 30, and Jesus said to, to him, truly I say to you, to your, that you yourself, this very night, before the cock crows twice, shall three times deny me. Peter and all the rest were saying, no, 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 no. What did we learn? When Jesus says something, it's going to happen. This is the context in which we have the Lord's table. We come to church. We come before the Lord. And perhaps some of us have been majorly betrayed by a lover. Or we have betrayed the Lord by some other lover. And we come before the table. And Jesus knows. Maybe we have had illicit drinks of sex and drugs or alcohol or some other illicit thing. And the Lord Jesus knows. Or we have had a loved one do, taste illicit things and we're wounded and we come to the table. We may have experienced somebody else's damaging anger and rage against us. Or maybe someone else experienced the rage we have. 
the anger we have. And we have wounded them. And we come to the table. Maybe we have been falsely accused. Or maybe we have falsely accused someone else. Maybe we have been neglected or rejected. Or maybe we have neglected and rejected somebody else. And we come to the table. And maybe we know of others that have experienced what we're talking about. And we come to the table. And we are powerless and helpless to fix or heal anything. Those deep wounds that we have or that we have caused in someone else, we are powerless to fix, to heal. Jesus comes into those realities. Jesus comes and he understands that we're powerless. God has provided in the midst of all those realities, God has provided. This is what this table is about. That Jesus came into the world, this guilty world, our guilt, our mess, and he died for all, all of our sins. By his wounds we are healed, the scriptures say. We come to the table not just as a religious thing, the weightiness behind the table, the wonderful work of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing where we are. Sure, we can provide the physical bread, the wine, we can do that. But the meaning behind these elements, the eternal Son of God, Dying an awful, awful death so that we would be forgiven and healed and restored to God and to one another. That's the meaning of this table. And praise be to God that He has provided that and we can, we can come to Him freely he, he instituted the table so that we would be reminded. So that we would, we would enjoy Him and enjoy one another because we have this wonderful forgiveness and healing from Him. Because we forget, no? We forget. By the time we know it, we're scratching and clawing to protect ourselves. To make a name for ourselves. To make sure we're not forgotten. To make sure that life works right. And Jesus comes into that reality. All our reality. And he says, come. This bread is my body, meaning my life. I lived it perfectly for you. You haven't. You couldn't. You never will. But I did it for you. This bread is my life. And so take, eat. As we take the bread and we eat, it becomes a part of us. His righteousness. But before that could happen, he had to give up his life. And that's the cup. He gave up his, he poured out his blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is now the new way that you're able to connect to God. Be connected to God is through my shedding of my blood. And he gave thanks both for the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples. He took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples. Take drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do not forget I come into all your reality. All your reality. And I take care of it. Will you trust me? Will you partake in faith that I've done this for you? And when we do, we are united to God. And we are united to one another. 
But it is a clear choice. Will you trust in Christ? Will you? I dare say that I would say probably everyone here, most everyone here, has trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But perhaps there's one of you that have, uh, has not. Maybe you've heard the gospel, but you never have really. Maybe you've relied on your parents or your friends or, oh, going to church. No, it's a personal decision that you make. It's between you and the Lord. Not between you and whoever's sitting next to you or someone, someone that you love. No, it's between you and the Lord. Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And the Bible says that when you trust in Jesus, you are saved. Saved from the judgment of God. Won't you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now before we partake, 1 Corinthians 11 speaks about you need to partake in a worthy manner. That is, come clean before God. Meaning confess. Meaning be honest about your realities. Relational sins. Be honest about your own. And maybe the anger because you've been sinned against. And you're just focusing on yourself rather than the Lord. I don't know. But let's go before the Lord and confess to Him. Confess to Him. And then we'll partake. Let's pray.